it was like it was the trip was with Lutheran World Relief, but there were just so many different organizations that worked with it. There were Equal Exchange, which is based in the U.S., where they are um, kind of like the distributors of the coffee that comes from Nicaragua, and they're like getting it um, just to like the churches and whatnot, and just different buyers around the U.S. Like the Center for Global Education, oh, yeah, um, which is the um, college that put it on, and they have an office in Managua. Um, they basically led us around the city. There were two, Juan Carlos, um, who was our basically interpreter, and Joe, who is, uh, Juan Carlos is Nicaraguan, and Joe is also fluent in Spanish, but he lives in Nicaragua, was born in the U.S. Um, and they do like five or six of these trips every year, but they work for the Center for Global Education. And the first day, actually, on our like orientation to Nicaragua, we got like a three-hour lecture on the history of Nicaragua, and we also met with um, the representative, one of the, the one of the workers in Nicaragua, who's working for Lutheran World Relief, and that was very interesting too. Well, the two people that were from Equal Exchange um, actually came on our trip with us and just kind of accompanied us around and just added to our experience a little bit by giving us what they know from working there. And um, so they kind of did a little presentation the first night that we were there, and they talked to us about um, like what makes up fair trade. And um, so there's like basically five principles that like will will be there if you know that your coffee is fair trade. Like these are the things that it has to be. So um, a minimum price has to be paid for the coffee, um, no matter what the market price is, because oftentimes with just conventional coffee, like um, just the regular market will. The coffee will drop below um, a price where the farmers are making money, so they're actually losing money on their crops a lot of the time. So it's hard for them to like hold on to their coffee and like wait out for a better price because they don't know if it's going to go bad. So this makes it really a lot better for the farmers and just better security for them. And then secondly, there's um, a social premium that is charged um, in the, within this minimum price. Um, and it goes towards social programming for the farmers and like the cooperatives. The cooperatives they, yeah. yeah. So the cooperatives like disperse it to the community. And um, a lot of the like even the people like in the community that aren't a part of the cooperative benefit from this as well. It's not just confined to those who are actually a part of the community. They help get kids school supplies and whatnot in all their communities. And then um, the third one is that it must be bought from a democratically run organization of small farmers. And four, the um, credit is offered to the farmers ahead of time before they actually deliver their coffee because there's a lot of expense that goes in and this process is kind of like, it can be lengthy and the farmers like won't see their profits for quite a while, I mean, until it gets exported and then sold. So <coughs> that can be a, quite a while. So um, with fair trade, um, the buyers are giving 60% of the price of the coffee to the farmers up front to help them with all their costs. And then um, the fifth one is that environmental standards are met in the production of the coffee, um, the whole process, and um, the 12 most harmful chemicals, when those are banned, those are not used in the process at all, and then labor standards are also met for the workers who are involved in the whole process. But apparently the children like can work there like if they're with their family as long as it doesn't interfere with their schooling yeah. so they don't and it's not like child labor but like if you're growing up on a farm you're going to help your family with and also and stuff like that, so. when we were there they weren't school wasn't in session they don't yeah. start again until february so we saw whole families yeah. <laughs> is the coffee seasonal in terms of yeah it, we were there at the harvesting season, I mean, it's lenient, but it ends in a few weeks, the main harvesting season. So it's, it's a couple of months. It's about two months, yeah. yeah. And I think the, we asked what the market price was for coffee while we were down there. It was $1.13 was what it was while we were there. But again, it fluctuates. And part of what got the fair trade going was um, the coffee crisis of like the 1990s. and. Um, coffee prices just like really plummeted were, and yeah. it was terrible so this is that's kind of what um, started the whole fair trade thing. And actually Equal Exchange is the first fair trade distributor of coffee in the United States. Okay. During the coffee crisis they had to go and bring it through Canada and like go through all these measures to get it here 
So yeah. did they take their children to work with them, or yeah. they were too little to be <clears throat> but Right. Yeah, um, that, uh, they are probably ten times better at making coffee than we are, honestly. Yeah. The plants start, I mean, they grow seven feet tall, but there's beans all the way up. So, and actually, an interesting fact is that most Nicaraguan farmers have never tasted their quality coffee because mm -hmm. it's way more beneficial for them to ship it out than for them to drink it, even like a cup. Yeah. No, they won't. They drink like the bad quality stuff. That <laughs> yeah, because they were showing us when we were at yeah. the roasting place. They were like, oh, and here's the bad quality coffee, and this is what we drink, and this is what they sell in our stores. <laughs> yeah. and, then, and they're actually trying to get that market. Like now it's one of their new projects is they're trying to get people in Nicaragua to buy high quality coffee because that's a whole other market they haven't touched. So. So do you gals drink coffee? Um, nope. Not a lot. <laughs> so I was just wondering, did you we, taste we it? We tried it. Down there, I so drank like, coffee all week. We did and the man, coffee. And, yeah. <laughs> and like, good. I don't drink yeah. caffeine. And could so you taste the difference? Drink. Could you taste it? Oh, we, yeah, you could yeah. taste. Between the high and the low. Yeah. 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 They had we could actually all that. the cupping, the, the samples that we cupped were, the scale is from zero to 100. And like, anything above 90 is like, rare to find that good and we cupped stuff between 80 and 86 so none of it they didn't like give us any 40s like just to throw yeah. us off. I'm just but. curious what the 40 would taste like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was kind of curious too but they didn't have any. Well um, on our second night there they shipped us out to this mountain village of Lorena which was just this really bumpy bus ride up these sc really scary roads and <laughs> it, was, it was way out there so we get up there and this is the farming cooperative where um, just local people are coming to pick coffee from the farms we saw some of the photos from there where they were doing their um, depulping process there and the fermentation so our group is about 13 and we had two or three people going out with each host family so there was I don't know how many women, maybe like five or six, five or six. that came out and um, we departed to go spend the evenings with them. And um, we were really fortunate because a lot of the people in our group um, were fluent in Spanish or had some Spanish skills. I have none. Lisa has limited. And <laughs> we, I ended up with one woman who was kind of the coordinator and with Lutheran World Relief and she was very fluent in Spanish and then another one of the trip coordinators. And Lisa, on the other hand, had with two people who did not speak Spanish. At all. And um, I had the most Spanish experience <laughs> because, <laughs> oh, four years ago in high school. Yeah. So, so I had to bring some of that back. The oldest daughter was actually really interesting. There were seven girls in this family and one boy who was the youngest. And at the end, by the end of the night, we were like joking and like had gotten past the language barrier a little bit. I learned that she is in school for nursing. She's the same age as I am, so that was really cool to talk to her. And she's uh, going for nursing, but all of her siblings will be going into agriculture. So, so yeah, you see a lot of that with their families there. They're, they want to stay there and help their families work at the farms. I mean, some of them will go off to college for different things, but the majority of them want to stay there and help. And um, so the family that I was with, um, was good because we had the translators, so we were able to have a little bit more in-depth conversations with them. They were, they were really fun. A bunch of the kids were outside playing with us in the evening, and they, it was just really, it was such a change, like going out to this mountain village and going into their little tiny houses, and they, they gave up three beds for us that night, so, I mean, they have like eight people living in their house, and it was just, they're, they're really, they're so like hospitable to us, and they just, it just seemed like they really enjoyed having us there. Imelda was um, one of the key co-op um, women who worked there, and um, oh, she was just one of the more instrumental people with the co-op. I'm not sure exactly what her title was, but um, we also met her daughter, who works in one of the nearby cities, and her name was Darlene. And she was just one of the, like, the most like, awesome people that I met while I was there. She, um, she was 19 years old. She, just, she looked way more mature than that. And um, she had a two-year-old son, and she was a single mother. And she lived right next door to her mom. And they had just gotten a grant to build a house there. And it was just 
part of a project with Luke and Roman Leaf where they were building just simple, decent houses for them. So it was just basically two rooms and then a main room area. And most of their kitchens were outside with their wood stoves. She was just really so amazing. She was just really impressive. She worked, started out working as a secretary at um, the office for the um, ecotourism, which is what we were doing essentially. Yes. They had with about six groups per year. And um, so she started out working as a secretary there and now she is the coordinator of that area of ecotourism for Nicaragua. So she would moved up there pretty quickly and she's also attending like the university full time and she um, just asked me like what I did, what my job was. So we figured out that we were both secretaries. I work at the campus ministry <laughs> office and she used to work in this other office. So it was, it was just really cool. We talked to her for a really long time that evening.